I was trying to think of a way to, to do a Ratatouille bringing the perspective quote there, but... Hey everybody, welcome back to Video Connection. I'm Aaron, this is Dan. Uh, today we are going to be talking about The Menu. It is directed by Mark Mylod, starring Ray Fiennes, Anya Taylor-Joy, and Nicholas Holt. It's rated R and it's currently streaming on HBO Max. This video was recorded at an earlier date. We apologize and thank you for your patience with this error. A young couple travels to a remote island to eat at an exclusive restaurant where the chef has prepared a lavish menu with some shocking surprises. So Dan, what was your gut reaction to the menu? I enjoyed it immensely. It's interesting because it wasn't super high on my list of things to go see. Um, it's not to say that I wasn't interested in it. I thought it looked interesting and I wanted to see it. But as you may recall, you might have had to apply a bit of gentle arm twisting to get me to bump it to the top of my list so we could talk about it. And having, having said that, I am pleasantly surprised to say that it is probably in the running to possibly be one of my favorite movies of the year. Wow. That's high praise. And now that I've given it that high praise, I have to ask you, what was your opinion? I am so conflicted hmm. on this movie. Um, I did enjoy it. I enjoyed it a lot. And there are a lot of things about it I liked. But I feel like I might have gone into it with just a little bit too high of expectations. So it was, it was a very mixed bag for me. Probably tips the scale towards thumbs up. But uh, I think there's a lot to unpack. All right. <laughs> this will be interesting. One where we don't agree 100%. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to uh, just throw one tidbit in here to start this discussion. My wife has been re-watching Top Chef like from the beginning on Peacock. Mm. So I have been drenched in like, you know, cooking of fine foods and such. And I felt like that was such a neat perspective to have coming into this movie because there was a very strong aspect of the food prep that happens in the movie that I was so, ooh, ooh, oh, they're doing little things and like, oh, they prepped with that. You know, it's just it's just so funny yeah. coming from that that place in this weird reality context to this fantasy movie uh, context. But seeing so much overlap of the no, I think they nailed the <laughs> inside the kitchen culture for the fine dining. So that was a little bit of perspective I was bringing into it. The first thing that jumps out to me is that the movie looks amazing. Uh, you know, the costumes, the sets, the lighting, the framing of the shots. This movie is presented visually with the kind of meticulous precision that you would expect from actual foods being served at a super exclusive location, such as the one in the movie itself. And I don't think that's an accident. No, indeed. What are we eating, a Rolex? I, I had read somewhere that there was a person involved in some very fancy uh, food documentaries that at least was a consultant on this movie that helped out with you know the food photography so that they could maximize that elite feeling you're describing. That would make sense. And it totally worked. Yep. Also, the cast I thought was amazing. Uh, we can start right off with Ray Fiennes as the chef was perfect. There are only a handful of actors who can pull off these seemingly contradictory traits that he does here, where he is both 100% controlled and unhinged, and he's charming and likable, but also scary. And that's kind of a tricky balancing act to pull off convincingly. Uh, off the top of my head, I would say people like Anthony Hopkins, Gary Oldman, uh, the late Alan Rickman, Gene Smart, I would put in there, and even Jake Gyllenhaal. Which, if you're surprised to hear me say Jake Gyllenhaal, you clearly haven't seen Nightcrawler, and you probably should, because it's excellent. You should. I'm noticing a lot of British dudes were on that list he just said. Mm. There must be something to this. I wonder if something about their training is a little bit different over there. Mm. I think there were moments where you got little flashes of his Nazi character from Schindler's List, where you had that, ah, like, frightened. and then mm -hmm. But then there were those other moments of just like, wow, what an amazing chef. This guy has all this, you know. Totally what you said. <laughs> right. And of, of course, Anya Taylor-Joy and Nicholas Holt were good as well, but we can't really talk, I don't think, about them specifically without getting into plot stuff, which we'll probably cover a little bit later. You won't know till the end. The other standout for me was Hong Chao, 
who I had previously only seen in the Watchmen series, also excellent, and I liked her in that, but in this as Elsa, the hostess. We'll endeavor to make your evening as pleasant as possible. She was excellent because she's also doing sort of the duality thing where she is being polite and subservient in her mannerisms while also being 100% in charge. And I think it's interesting that, you know, with this room full of guests, all of whom are arguably powerful in one way or another, either through fame or, you know, clout or having lots of money, she somehow makes them all seem like a room full of kindergartners and she's the teacher who is in control. Absolutely. Something, you know, she has in common with Ray Fiennes in this movie is the way that it's so much more frightening when when that unknown scary stuff is hidden behind the facade of exactly. warmth and friendliness. Mm -hmm. And she actually did it more than he did, I think, where she was just, a, oh, I'm a gracious host. I'm always smiling. Even when I'm saying things that might be threatening you in a way that's terrifying, I'm still saying it with a big smile and, right. uh, you know, like I'm your mom. And it's just, yeah, she she nailed it. I was going to go ahead and throw in in a non-spoilery fashion that Anya Taylor-Joy and Nicholas Holt did a great job. I think that I've thought that of pretty much every performance I've seen from both of them. Sure. So they've maintained. You have to try the mouthfeel of the mignonette. Please don't say mouthfeel. Oh, it's interesting having seen The Northman recently and seeing you know Anya Taylor-Joy play a different character in a different kind of movie. It was fun for some comparison, but I got to tell you, She's just magnetic. Mm -hmm. Like when she's on screen, it just she's got whatever that it factor is that you want when you are uh, an on-screen personality and, you know, even separated from her acting ability. Mm -hmm. There's just something engaging about her that uh, I think she's pulled in every single time I've seen her do a different character. And she did it again with this one. Yep. So thumbs up. And also, we can't not talk about John Leguizamo because... Despite the fact that he's very well respected, I think he is still probably underrated as an actor. He's one of those guys that you can put into any role, big or small, good guy or bad guy, and he's going to give you exactly what you want out of it. And he does that consistently time after time. For any viewers who have not seen the 1996 Romeo and Juliet from Baz Luhrmann, I think that's worth watching also. And I know it's kind of a polarizing film. Some people don't like how over the top it is with the stylization or maybe struggle with the Shakespearean dialogue. But just in terms of like raw, like artistic expression, that movie is like slap you in the face, drop the mic, like artistic statement. And John Leguizamo as Tybalt, the Prince of Cats, is very, very good in it. Huh. I haven't seen it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm probably mature enough now to actually watch it and appreciate it more than I may have at one point. I, I know I've seen a couple clips and I had actually forgotten that mm -hmm. he was in it. But that's cool. He's a guy who does a really good job, like across the spectrum, um, mm -hmm. which interestingly does seem to be a characteristic you find with people that are more comedic, that they tend to do well shifting to drama and it doesn't always mm -hmm. translate the other way. But, you know, because he's done stuff that's like Adam Sandler level ridiculous. Sure. But you can put him in a you know straight drama, 100 percent serious, and he'll play that part. So I, I agree with that. Yeah, he can be a cartoon voice in the Ice Age series, and then he can actually scare you as a villain. And that's, you know, that's range. I don't know if you had seen this, but I was reading about how he, he based his character in this movie a bit on Steven Seagal. And he's supposed hmm. to be kind of like a burned out yeah. star that one time was really cool. Mm -hmm. This is happening too much while the camera's recording, but I can't remember now the name of the movie that John Laguizamo was in with Steven Seagal, mm -hmm. where they were like a bunch of soldiers that went up on a plane that had been hijacked. And I, I'm i putting the poster up right now, obviously, because I looked it up after <laughs> I did this. Oh, look, there it is. There's the poster. But I had heard stories many years ago where John Leguizamo talked about what a terrible person Steven Seagal is and what a big jerk he was in that movie. Mm -hmm. And in fact, spoilers, his character dies like halfway through that movie because supposedly everyone, including the director, hated working with him so much because he was such a jerk that they killed his character off instead of letting him live through the whole movie so they didn't have to keep filming with him, which doesn't surprise me in the slightest. I thought it was a pretty cool thing for him to draw inspiration from because it seemed very appropriate to his character, who's kind of this washed up actor. Well, I was just going to say, in terms of uh, dislikes or criticisms, I don't really have any worth mentioning. I was curious what there was that you might have thought could have been better. 
Overall, I feel like the movie wasn't quite as strong as I hoped it was going to be. I feel like it it had a good story, but I didn't think it had a great story. Another part of it, and I feel like the the trailers put you in this position of, you know, there's a lot of mystery going on there in terms of mm-hmm. what's going to happen. What's the sinister nature of this? Like, clearly, it's not just going to be people sitting and eating. Something's going to happen. So part of the fun was, you know, how, how does that get revealed? And I kind of wanted it to be more than it was. I feel like um, hmm. what they did with the story didn't didn't dig as deep as I thought it could. And it's probably about as specific as I can get without yeah. mm-hmm. getting into our spoiler section. So I won't I won't say anything just yet. But as a general notion, that's kind of where it was. Having said that, you know, I agree with you. The cast was awesome. They were, you know, even the small parts. I thought the people were well cast. Mm-hmm. All the acting was great. Um, it, it was beautiful the way that it was shot, not even just, you know, the food and the cooking and all that sort of stuff that was very specific, but just in general, it just was pretty, it was a pretty location. Yeah. There was lots of thoughtful, you know, camera angles and lighting, etc. Very well made. Something that was actually kind of fascinating to me was as you get into the story and these people have been in this restaurant and they're talking and you're moving around the room and you're hearing different conversations, it kind of hit me. This movie could have just been a straight drama that was about a bunch of people sitting in a restaurant Hmm. eating. And that was the whole movie. Because after I feel, you know, 10, 15 minutes of that initial engagement with these characters, I was interested in all of the different tables. I wanted to I wanted to hear this actor keep talking to his assistant. I wanted to hear those three business guys keep telling whatever stories they were going to tell and learn about Mm -hmm. who they were. I wanted to know what the deal was with this guy on his date. You know, I wanted to know what the deal was with this rich guy and his wife who's drinking too much. And it it just, I have to give them a lot of credit for how invested they got me in those characters, which, you know, to me, that's part of what, you know, I think tips the scale. The positive is, is just that I was, I was into that room. I wanted to know Mm -hmm. everyone in the room. I wanted to know what everybody was doing there and what was going on. Uh, even beyond the the larger, more obvious uh, question of why are we here? What's going to happen? Simpler way of saying all that is it was a pretty well-written script. Mm-hmm. There were some points where there was a little distinction in tone. And sometimes it felt like it wanted to be a little more realistic. And sometimes it felt like it wanted to be a little more poetic. I feel like there were parts that felt grounded and believable. And there were some other things that weren't quite as much, you know, not completely the other direction, but just a little bit less trying to stick to what would be the completely realistic thing in the moment. Hmm. And I kind of felt like it would have done better to stick harder to one of those choices or the other, but it is still a light criticism. It's not a heavy one. Didn't ruin the movie. It was just sort of like a, something that was significant enough for me to notice. Hmm. Okay. You mentioned that it was very well written in terms of, getting you invested in these characters. And so I think it's interesting to note that the writers, Seth Rice and Will Tracy, both uh, come from comedic writing backgrounds. This is, I believe, their first film that they've written. They previously worked on things like Late Night with Seth Meyers and The Onion and uh, John Oliver's show. So the fact that these guys have come from comedy writing and done this sort of black comedy thriller should illustrate Two things, I think. First, it should tell you that you shouldn't pigeonhole anyone in Hollywood based on their previous work. If someone has the chops, as they say, whether that is in acting or writing or directing, it shouldn't surprise you if they're able to jump from one genre to the other successfully. Um, I would say that Zach Kreger going from being a primarily comedic actor to suddenly writing and directing Barbarian, which was, you know, a surprise hit horror film from this year, is another illustration of that point. And secondly, it illustrates that being really funny, as one must be to be in the writer's room of a late night show or The Onion, requires a high degree of intelligence. And being very smart might mean that you can transcend genre and jump lanes and still be successful. And on that note, I also think that Mark Mylod, the director of this film, fits into that same category as well, where he had directed you know, TV shows, some of them pretty notable ones, Game of Thrones, Succession, but you know, this being... Only his second feature film, to my knowledge, the first one was a romantic comedy, What's Your Number, with Anna Faris and Chris Evans. I saw that. And so, (laughs) I did not. Oh, excuse me. I didn't see the movie. I saw that he directed it. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, okay. We should clarify. But the fact that he was able to jump from that being his his last movie to something like this should just tell you, like, you don't need to pigeonhole people based on their previous work. And now both of the writers and him are now going to be the guys who made the menu. So nobody should be underestimating them moving forward. Absolutely. Unless they make a flop. And then they'll be judged harshly because apparently in Hollywood, everyone's only as good as their last project. And they'll get put into writer-director jail. Hey. Or they'll fail upwards like the other half of the people that doesn't make any sense. But mm. who knows? I, I'm going to throw on the pile, you know, I feel like we have to say Jordan Peele just because that's mm, yeah, another yeah. like super funny guy, great comedy background. Now he's done a bunch of awesome horror movies and plenty of talent to go around for a lot of these people. You got to be smart to be funny. And if you're smart, you can do other stuff. Um, you mentioned the direction of Succession which I found interesting because as a huge fan of that show, I thought that there were some tonal similarities in this movie. Hmm. And I feel that someone who is a fan of that show would probably be a fan of this movie as well. So that's worth noting if Succession is something you enjoy. And if you haven't seen it, check it out. Spoilers! <laughs> One really smart thing that I think they did with this movie, if you are intending to have violence towards characters as they do with this group of patrons, is that, as you said, being invested in their storylines, they're gradually peeling back the layers of these characters and revealing sordid histories and past indiscretions and things like that, so that by the time it gets around to the violence, you're actually able to accept it because you realize these aren't all a bunch of great people. No, we're going to die today. Yes, we are. Yeah. I think that was very smart because if it was just straight up, you know, this was a group of good people with bad things happening to them, I think the audience would have a lot harder time accepting it. So even if it's still not justified, I mean, this is still not like, you should not take this movie to be aspirational. Hmm. I'm just saying that if you're going to have violence towards characters in a movie, it's nice if the audience can be okay with it. Seemed funny about three hours ago. I agree with that statement. And at the same time, there was something to the fact that I felt like I got to know them a little bit mm -hmm. that made me still feel bad for them, even though I sort of didn't feel bad for them. You at least feel bad for Judith Light. She was kind of the one that didn't really have it coming, but... The no doubt former trophy wife who's, yeah, basically <laughs> just got the short end of the stick in this particular situation. I almost feel bad criticizing this movie because I liked so much of it. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for me to talk about, but in the spoiler section, I feel that I can be a lot more free with the things that I intended to say. And again, maybe this is just based on the marketing and the trailer and that sort of thing. I expected much like a movie like Barbarian, where you, mm -hmm. you don't really know what's going on. You know the setup and then you, you have no idea where it's going to go from there. This one didn't stray too terribly far from what I knew. And I guess that was where I was a little disappointed. I kind of thought that this movie would just devolve into utter chaos by the end and that it would be a madhouse, you know, whatever the explanation might be. But I just figured there was going to be like walls covered in blood, limbs flying or like an alternate universe with Cthulhu coming out of a portal or like, who knows? Tonight will be madness. I honestly didn't think it would be that wacky, but I just thought that it would somehow go from this neat, clean you know, setting of this restaurant to utter chaos. Yeah. And it didn't. It was more of just this continued, you know, sort of restrained darkness. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was something that I just see as a choice they made that wasn't consistent with my expectation. So it wasn't even necessarily that they did anything wrong. I just think I was too pointed this way and then it went that way. And then I was kind of, oh, oh. Sure. I think you could place some of the blame of that on the, the marketing and the trailers, because I would agree that I thought it was marketed a little bit more as horror than it actually turned out to be. Yeah. And if you're expecting horror, you would assume, you know, from the setup, where else could it go other than maybe turning into some wild slasher with blood on the walls, as you said. Yeah. I feel like that's a little bit of a misdirection. And I am curious what the marketing impact would have been if they had gone a different direction and made it feel more like succession. What if it just mm -hmm. felt like oh, here's a bunch of elites going to an elite restaurant to have an elite meal and there's witticisms and they're probably not great people and, oh, the chef might not like them very much. And that might have been as far as they went, mm -hmm. um, which would have been super interesting because when you went in the theater, very quickly you'd have been like, what's going on right. in this place? Like, this is creepy. 
they could have gotten some really nice word of mouth that way too, because throwing that curveball at people would have been a thing that you would have had to tell people, oh, this movie is going to get you. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not expecting this one. Go see it. Yep. So yeah, that would have been an interesting angle to take. Nicholas Holt's character being the guy who just very much sees himself as the foodie, you know, even to the degree that he's looking down on John Leguizamo, the actor's character, you know, as, oh, he thinks he's a foodie. You know, he thinks he's the real deal. He's so invested in the food. And then I suspect that there's a little bit of an intentional correlation between the critics and the foodies that are at this restaurant and movie critics partaking of film as these characters are partaking of the food. And I think probably the professional critics are there uh, embodied by the professional food critics who's there. And I think that Nicholas Holt perhaps is the stand in for the more amateur critic, perhaps as people like ourselves, who he sees himself as the ultimate foodie. He thinks he knows what he's talking about, but when it's his turn to get in the kitchen, he can't really make the dishes like he thinks he can. And I think that there's a little bit of some jabs in there that are intentional, perhaps, on the part of the movie makers of, you know, saying, making movies really is hard, guys, and even though you know about it, there's a difference between knowing about it and being able to actually pull it off. And as filmmakers, maybe we deserve a little bit of respect. I, I'm very impressed by that assessment because I didn't think of it that deeply. I think I was so in the food world, but I couldn't agree with you more. That absolutely is how it came across in that moment. It was so entertaining. Um, you've gotten far enough into the story that it's like these two characters have become more despicable. Mm-hmm. You know, we know who they are. But when he's, he's oh, no, you're ready. Cook cook Mm -hmm. when he kept saying cook and and you're like you know how terrified nicholas holt's character Mm -hmm. is but how how excited he is at the potential and then boy does he fall flat on his face so fast (laughs) which is the fun part is that the the story was so well done it supports that message you just shared so strongly addendum to all the spoilery stuff and i know this is total speculation from a clickbait article but i had to give him credit for oh that was a neat idea there was a suggestion just to give you the context of the scene, Nicholas Holt is forced to cook by the head chef, does a terrible job. The chef whispers something in his ear, which is devastating. We don't find out what it was. And then in a little while, he goes in the back and hangs himself. Someone suggested that perhaps the thing that he whispered was the way you're going to be part of this meal is you're going to be in it. And that maybe the hmm. cheeseburger that was presented to Anya Taylor-Joy at the end was made out of Nicholas Holt. (laughs) I don't know if there was enough stuff on screen to allow that to happen, Mm -hmm. but I had to give them credit for, well, you know, that would be more or less in keeping with the way the rest of the evening went. (laughs) I don't necessarily think that's what happened, but it was an interesting thought. My, My counterpoint to that would be that at the time that Nicholas Holt is told to go hang himself or whatever he's told, the chef had no idea that Anya, T- Anya Taylor Joy's character was about to throw that curveball of requesting the cheeseburger, that is true. which was digging into his past. So I would say, very true. You know, it's a good it's a good idea. It would be like a fun, I mean, terrible, dark thing to happen. But I think logically, it probably doesn't fit with the story. That is fair. So I will say, congratulations, clickbait, on actually having an original creative thought. You got him. <laughs> I, I'm not angry that I read your article, so that I thank you for thinking about it, even if it doesn't all hold up. So I, I, another thought is more my criticism, I guess, is the, you know, as we find out what's really going on, there's this sort of rich versus poor thing that becomes mm-hmm. a theme. And, you know, that's where you know, Ray Fiennes comes from the poor. He's ascended to the rich he's grown disgusted with the rich i struggled with that because i felt like that theme was kind of cliche but i also felt like the way that they did it wasn't too heavy-handed like it wasn't punching you in the face with some kind of political message so well i mean i think it was a little deeper than just rich versus poor i think it was also those who have worked in service industries and those who haven't like those who have only taken versus those who have experienced what it is like to serve which probably pretty much is a rich versus poor, you know, it probably fits those same lines, but I think it was more than just the the having or the absence of money. Yeah. I think there's more of a, you know, a, a frame of behavior that fits. That makes sense. And that, you know, is kind of, I guess, to my point of where it wasn't just base level middle school punch you in the gut, mm-hmm. like boring attempt at uh, political discourse. 
it rang true <laughs> in the context. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I talked about realism versus poetry, I felt like the closer we got to the end, the more that the obviously bad things were going to happen to the people, the less they were resisting them. I felt like it kind of kept going down that slope where I was thinking to myself, why aren't they trying to escape? Although, to be fair, they also gave them the opportunity, all the men anyway, to escape, and then demonstrated the futility of trying to do so. This is what you're paying for. I feel like by the time those guys did their best to run away, like even with a head start, and as they're brought back in, like panting and wheezing and realizing they're not the badasses they thought they were, I think that's where the, their spirit of any, any resistance was broken at that point. That is a very strong point, because obviously the psychology of their situation was heavily manipulated by being given the opportunity to run away and then failing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking through literally everyone. They caught every single last one of them. Nobody, you know, even had a shot. Yeah, even the younger guys that you would think maybe had more of a shot didn't pull it off. That's true. We Most of us would like to think we'd be able to survive in that situation. But I mean, the reality is probably the majority of people wouldn't at least not against sort of the odds that they had set up against them there. So, well, I guess, I guess that would let me revise my final statement a little bit because I, I felt like the ending got a little cheesy. You know, it was, it was very dramatic and it was supposed to be, but it also just didn't sit with me a hundred percent. All these people literally sitting there, mm -hmm. letting that happen to them and, and meeting their demise when it's like, surely one of you, there would be a last ditch. No, I'm going to try one more time to jump up and run away. And also, in addition to just the psychology of letting them go and then catching them, there was also the fact that they're highlighting everybody's, you know, crimes and indiscretions for them and bring them up so that, you know, the actor and his assistant are admitting like, oh, I stole money from you, oh, blah, blah, blah. You know, this guy cheated on his wife. I feel like Judith Light's character is probably the lone exception where she didn't really have anything in her past that had it coming. But I think the rest of them... They've just had, you know, their noses put in their own flaws and sort of they're almost resigned to their fate because they realize maybe we're not as good a people as we thought we were. Yeah. So I think the combination of being forced to confront their own darkness and also seeing the futility of trying to escape maybe could reasonably result in them sort of just accepting what's coming at that point. Yeah. Well, and, you know, interesting to me is that Judith Light's character is the one that I feel like probably is the most likely in the group to just sort of think to herself, my life sucks. I don't even want to leave. And even mm -hmm. though she's the one that's probably least deserving of what's happening um, and to support your argument on top of what you already said, there's also the simple idea of this guy knows all our dark secrets. If we do get out of here, maybe we're still going to get exposed for the thing, which mm -hmm. we would be better off dead or maybe right. would feel that way. So, And Judith Light as the lone decent person among them, even acknowledging like her little head, head gesture to Anya Taylor-Joy of saying like, yes, like leave us, get out of here. It's almost like a part of her is able to escape with her just, you know, as the lone survivor. There's a part of me that suspects that the much younger version of Judith Light is very much like what Anya Taylor-Joy's character was like, that she was mm -hmm. once perhaps a mistress or at minimum, you know, a, a trophy wife that that saw her as, you know, sort of, I'm spiritually escaping by seeing you escape. Right. I'm vicariously escaping. So, right. yeah. Which, you know, and that was a character that barely had any lines, but I still felt like there was uh, weight to it. So I think Dan's convinced me that this was written even better than I thought it was, but it Ooh. just didn't have the emotional gut feeling for me when I was sitting in the theater. But maybe on your next viewing, you'll like it even more. Maybe so. This is one of those movies that I think it'll be interesting to see where it is judged uh, over time. Like 10 years from now, how are people going to view this movie? And I suspect it will be judged favorably by that point. I, I think this is a movie that would age well. And I think this would be a movie people would watch and think, how didn't I see this when it came out? This is a good movie. That's why we're telling you now. So, Dan, would you recommend The Menu? I'm sure you will not be surprised at all by this point <laughs> that, yes, I would recommend it. If you, didn't, if you didn't see that coming, you haven't been paying attention. Yeah, I would recommend it. I think it's an excellent movie. What about you? What do you think? 
this has been an interesting experience for me because I feel like I've worked through a lot of the things that I didn't like about it and I have tipped those scales even further. So I will actually say uh, I would recommend this movie. It is actually really good. I guess I'm just saying it's not perfect, but I really enjoyed it. There's plenty to like. Well-written, clever, well-done, well-acted, and not necessarily like another movie I've seen before. So I think that's, that's true. worth thinking about. Um, yeah, so I'd say check it out. This is our twist ending because at the at the start of the show, it seemed like we were going to disagree, and now we're on the same page. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> one of these times, I swear, there's going to be a movie that one of us just flat out hates and the other one thinks is the most amazing thing ever. I can't wait. It's bound to happen. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a really interesting discussion. It'll be a great day. It's going to be a really long reel. It'll be an interesting day. <laughs> all right. That's all the time that we have. Thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate all of you guys watching Video Connection. And we'll see you next time. See ya.